already given it a read. It's a really good book. It's called Nothing Compares to You, An Oral History of Prince by Ture, just out as of the time we're doing this interview, which is on September 2nd, came out on August 24th. Um, and there's and I've been talking about it on the radio and saying, hey, if you if you want to know a good amount about Prince, read this book, because there's a lot of important people involved who really know him. This is that's a that's a good sign. So I mean, you've been well involved and anyone who reads the book comes away with that impression. Um, what was the impetus for this particular book? Well, I just I looked at my sort of notes and research and I was like, I've been on this Prince beat for like 15 or 20 years. And like, I think I have a pretty good sense of the arc of this life. I've talked to a ton of people who were close to him. I think I could do something pretty interesting that like, you know, uses these interviews that I've been doing for a while and gives you a really intimate sense of who he is and what happened to him from beginning to end. And then in the process of doing it, it was like, let me call one more person. Let me call one more person. And that person, hey, can you introduce me to like, yeah, I can introduce you to him and her. And even like, you know, Brown Mark, I had been trying to meet for a lot for years and years and he never responded to anything. And then suddenly he was like, oh, yeah, I'd love to talk to you. And, you know, um, finally got to talk to Bobby Z and Anna Fantastic and like just more and more people start, you know, and like people called me at like, you know, I, you can't put my name on the record, but I'm going to tell you this, this, and this, and that, that, and that. And I was like, wow, well, thank you very much for calling me. Um, some of them called like, like one of them called a fairly important person. I read your first Prince book and you got some things wrong. And I was like, please tell me like, <laughs> I want to know what I got wrong so that I could be, you know, so I could be right. And, um, you know, that was a really important and revelatory conversation. And just, you know, I developed a sense of the arc of the life, which is kind of like the thesis of the book. And let me try to tell you this uh, as succinctly as I can. He is, he leaves his mother's house when he's about 10 to go 11 to go live with his father his father kicks him out after about six months and he's about 12 or 13 and living in somebody else's house. And that experience with his parents led him to have a great deal of resentment and to feel abandoned by them and to feel like I need to become a rock star to show them uh, that I'm a worthy and valuable person to show up his mother and to get his father's love and attention because his father was a musician his mother was also a singer but his father had continued to be a playing musician at night in, in minneapolis in the clubs even after prince and his sister were born um so this is so this is the the focus of his teenage years of becoming a rock star to get back at his parents and so he is so driven that this is all he spends time doing. And he's living in uh, the, the home of Bernadette Anderson, who's this wonderful maternal woman who gives him a ton of encouragement when he's doing his first songs when he's like 13, 14. But she also has six children, she's divorced and she's pursuing an advanced degree. So it doesn't sound like she had the same amount of time to be like mothering him the way that most people's mothers are like on top of them and making sure you have an entirely balanced sort of diet um, in terms of all the all the things. And, you know, when you're a teenager, that is a critical time to learn like how to interrelate with people. And he spent all his time working on music and never really developing how do you relate to people? So this sets out the template of what we have going ahead because when he gets through his teens and into his twenties, that drive and that singular focus on music is really helpful, right? And it's propelling him upward. And he's way more comfortable with a guitar with a hundred thousand people in front of him than one-on-one -on -one talking to a single person. And if you're not talking about music, forget about it. He's completely lost. Mm -hmm. This is fine when he's in his 20s. This is okay when he's in his 30s. By the time he gets to his 40s and other people around him in his generation are 
you know, sliding into families and he's not, and he's not having that same deep level. He had many, many, many girlfriends, but not the same deep level of connection because just connecting with a person one-on-one was very hard. Um, you know, it's not the same. It's not working out. He gets married, loses a baby. Then they have a miscarriage after that. That propels him out of that marriage into another marriage that also doesn't work out. And so now he's sort of like middle age, no family, doesn't think family's going to have for him. He failed to have children. The fans are my family. The fans and the music are my wife and my children. And they had always been first ahead of the wives anyway. But now it's like, this is really, it's just me and you. So I have to keep this going. This is my identity. This is the reason why I get up in the morning. This is everything. But the body is breaking down after decades of touring all the time. And so how do I keep it going? He starts taking opioids at some point, I believe in the 90s, but it might've been in the 80s um, to like just be able to continue performing. And it's not this rock star hedonism, like, you know, like some people do Coke or whatever. This is like the, the, this is like the UPS driver, the nurse, you know, the factory worker who's like, I got to get out of bed to take care of my family, but my neck, my back, my neck, my hip, whatever is killing me, you know, and take mother's little helper and keep going. And that's what he was doing. And eventually it drags him down. Um, And it's really part of the tragedy of it is that in his teens and his twenties, he was super anti-drug because he's super focused on music. And, you know, some people say like, maybe he really had no idea how to handle dependency because he had not done, you know, just trying out usage like many of us do when we're younger. Um, So this is the general sort of arc of the life that I sort of started to piece together talking to a lot of different people about him. And that made me say, I think we have a book here. Mm -hmm. There's definitely that, that theme keeps coming through the, the work, the constant focus on, no, we're going to, okay, back to the Prince calls. You get, we've got to go back to the studio. That comes up over and over and over. Now we're going to go out and perform again over and over and over. There's so many what ifs that I come away with from this. Like, what if this was a little different? How does the life change? Starting with, if he has something resembling, a, I mean, I don't want to say a normal childhood because what's normal? But if he has something that doesn't involve so much abandonment, just from that very basic beginning, do do we get Prince the musician, that level of focus even at all? And kind of tying into that, if he's not living in with Andre Simone's mother and with what Bernadette's doing and welcoming all these people in and hanging out with them, again, like you said, and only and not having the proper parenting, even though it was a good environment he found himself in. But if he's not in that, how does that change? Those seem like two real seminal eras for him. I mean, hypotheticals are hard, but I think you're right that like if he didn't have Bernadette Anderson giving him both encouragement and clearly a lot of freedom in terms of the way that he wanted to spend his time, it wouldn't be the same. You know, I mean, this is a guy who mastered several instruments in lightning speed in terms of like you know lifetime like it could take a lifetime to master the guitar and he mastered like four or five major instruments in a few years um you know mastered uh the studio in a few years uh you know i mean like knew how to produce himself I, you imagine that if there had been a mom there who was saying like, you got to eat your vegetables, you got to be in bed by 10 o'clock, like these sorts of things, like, you know, you're not doing good in this class, what's going on? Um, you know, it, it, things would have been different thing, you know, he wouldn't have developed it. I mean, like, there's a, there's a story from Morris Day that I love you know, because Prince at 14, 15 did not have recording equipment at home. Morris Day lived around the corner and he had a four track recorder Mm -hmm. and he's knocking on Morris Day's door at 1 a.m., at 2 a.m., at 3 a.m. sometimes saying, I just thought of a song. I need to record this. 
what if there had been a mom who was saying, no, you cannot go to Morris's house at 1 a.m. to record a song. Like, you have to be at school at 7 a.m. And, you know, just things might have proceeded a lot differently. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely don't think we would have gotten the same character, certainly not at the young age that we got him. Um, did you have, and, and I know there's so much in the interviews that, that are in the book, but you start to think that, that, and I mean this in a good way, that pathological sense of creation and musicianship and work ethic. And I struggle to think of people, I mean, just in general life who are that way. I know there, there are people that are wired a certain way and they're, they're unique in their own ways. It, it, did anyone come to any other I don't want to say clinical diagnosis, but any way of trying to explain that away besides his childhood, besides his upbringing, did anyone have another take on that? Or is it just, he, that's who he was? I, I, I mean, I kind of, it's a great question. I kind of explored some things because you start to hear like, maybe he's bipolar, maybe he's autistic, like different things. And it, and none of those angles ever went anywhere. Um, there was no, there was no person who was close to him who could say like, yes, I saw this, this, and this. And this. so, you know, none of that, I, I think he's a lifelong insomniac because there's stories from, you know, Morris Day talking about the teenage years, you know, coming up on me at 3am. There's, you know, Susan Rogers and other people, Susanna Melvoin, who were like, you know, in his twenties, you know, 24 hour work days, 36 hour work. 48 hour work days. These are all normal things. He would sort of like, you know, work, work, work for, you know, two days, maybe two and a half days and then crash for half a day and then get right back at it um, to, you know, Morris Hayes from the NPG a little bit later in the career saying, you know, um, the guy, uh, you know, was a day walker vampire. That's what he called him. So it means like, <laughs> Throughout the life, people are saying the guy just barely ever slept. Jerome, Jerome from the time, who knew him from the neighborhood in Minneapolis, you know, was around and working with him, you know, in the 80s, still friends with him in the 90s. He's like, I don't know when he slept. I never saw him sleep ever on tour at home. I just never saw him sleep. He was, he, he would, he would go to, I would go to bed. He was awake. I would wake up. He was already awake. Like, I don't know when he slept, um, you know, so, I mean, not that I can think of anything that's like diagnosable, but there was definitely like, you know, the guy's just a machine. Mm -hmm. I was struck also by the consistency of commentary by the people who knew him, which would it make sense because they know him so well. But you would think with someone, I mean, at first blush, I would think, OK, here's a guy so private, doesn't reveal hardly anything that people might have different takeaways and yet maybe with the exception of chapter eight on the another lover hole in your your head uh, chapter which well that's a whole nother chapter to itself and there's some definitely different takes among the different people interviewed there other than that there's i, I was struck by the consistency of evaluation of him and the consistency of the stories that, that what did you come away with the same with the same thing that so many people saw how he behaved in such similar ways almost to the point of describing to a t the same words and verbiage well you know there's i mean it's i mean yes and no there's there's a consistency of who he is throughout the life in terms of the sense of drive you know the primacy of music in his life um, you know, the centrality of self of like what he needed was ahead of what everyone else needed all the time. You know, he was always the center of the room and center of attention. Um, but that said, you know, there's there's some level of growth and change or at least a sense of you're not sure who's going to walk in the room at any given time. I mean, like one of the one of the more interesting uh revelations that i got were the people in the revolution saying there were at least four princes and different personalities that might show up on a given day and we tried to quickly figure out who was there so that we would know how to behave and how to deal and who we were dealing with on that day and they had names for the four different personalities that they were encountering there was steve who was a super nice 
sweet guy. There was Shaft, who was like the tough guy, Alpha, who would like go on stage and crush. Uh, there was Marilyn Monroe, who was, you know, like very feminine and flirty and coquettish. Uh, and there was uh, Fred Sanford, who was kind of an ornery asshole, right? Who was just very <laughs> difficult and obnoxious. And, you know, when, when, when Fred Sanford would show up, he's attacking you throughout the rehearsal or the sound check and he's all over you and we're gonna wait until john gets his keyboard part right and if we have to be here all day we're gonna be here all day let's hear it again john nope that's not right do it again do it again um and just like you're like oh my god like he just crushed me today um and you didn't know who was coming by to who, each day. Um, so it was really sort of there, you know, but then, you know, some people talked about him being kind of mean, you know, toward toward people he worked with, worked who, who worked for him sometimes. But he could also be very sweet and loving and ennobling to people. There's a lot of people who talk about Prince saw something in me before I saw it in myself. And he gave me the chance to do something that I would have never gotten the chance to do. I was a photographer and he allowed me to become a video director. And now I'm a video director. I was a this and he allowed me to become that. Even Morris Day, you know, and he does this for a bunch of people, but Morris Day is probably the most interesting example. Morris Day was a drummer, you know, and they were trying to get Alexander O'Neill, who's also from Minneapolis to be the leader of the time. Uh, Alexander wanted more money than they were willing or able to pay at that time. And Prince said, Morris, why don't you do it? And Morris was like, no. Can you imagine Morris, like, shy? Like, <laughs> no, I'm a drummer. Like, I don't know how to do that. He's like, you, and Prince was like, no, I've seen you. Like, you know, they grew up together. I've seen you. You can do it. And Prince groomed him and coached him and talked to him and, like, lifted him up and like made him into one of the great front men of of his era um and like again just prince seeing something in you that you didn't see in yourself um and lifting you up it's you can't compare prince to someone else he is he is himself he is unique yeah but is there, can you think in all of this, just covering people over time and you've heard of, is there, is there another figure, public figure you can think of who is even somewhat borderline comparable in terms of, I can't even really describe it, but that sort of entity that that person is that's akin to a prince in terms of stature and remove from people and all of that i mean you know a lot of us think about james brown and Jimi hendrix right and those were the obvious influences that that appeared right away but i think about little richard this is the son of little richard there i mean if you put little richard alongside prince there's so many similarities from the hair to the movement to the way they uh, you know, danced along the gender line, you know, to the sort of just, just so much the exuberant uh, personality when performing. This is very much the son of Little Richard. Um, and, and, you know, and perhaps, you know, where Little Richard was, um, was gay, Prince was saying, you know, like, um, you know, I'm, I'm super straight, even though I love the girl, even though I love what the girls are wearing and to wear it, you know, like I'll be devastating to them, um, you know, but I mean, like more to me, much more so than James Brown and Jimi Hendrix. I see the son of little Richard. Uh -huh. um, I was struck by note 21 footnote 21 uh, on when Wendy Melboyne talks about beginning around diamonds and pearls that the, there was something little off and I don't have the quote right in front of me, but but the music was sounding different going forward from around that era that what it sounded like it was going a little faster or something to to that degree is. And I know it came in a footnote, but that really jumped out to me because even I would think that with with the music, like, there's something 
there's a spark that seems to be lacking and i don't know if it, if it was production whatever it was but a lot of artists when they're at their peak they can't continue that for decades on end there's a peak point it happens with athletes happens with artists it happens with a lot of people is that just a simple case of you can only be sublime for so long or was there something with the people around him that he didn't have the revolution folks by that point for several years what 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 do you think wendy melvin was picking up there that I'm, i have to imagine others were picking up as well yeah i mean i think you're right on both those sort of notions that yeah one can only be sublime for but so long i mean especially for recording artists so much of what you're doing is serving people who are like 15 to 25 who live for culture, like live in clubs or live to like, you know, get the new record right when it comes out and like, you know, dig into it. And the lo the further away you get from 15 to 25, the harder it is to speak to those sort of people. I mean, like there's very few recording artists who are really like in the fight and like in the culture after like 40, right? Like you might be able to squeeze it out to like 35, 38, but like, you know, the culture changes, the generation changes, you know, and that happens to everyone. But part of what M Wendy and others were talking about was the end of the revolution. And, you know, one thing I didn't realize is that Prince made music so fast that his releases were far behind what he had created. So what we know of as the end of the revolution, there was still revolution music coming out for years after that, okay? So by the time you get to around Diamonds and Pearls, he's now releasing stuff that is with different people and with different influences. Prince is making all the music, but the people around him are having an influence. There's a reason why Dirty Mind sounds new wavy you know prince was alone in the studio making most of that music but des dickerson was like yo new wave and punk like this is where it's at you know when you get to purple rain prince made that music but wendy and lisa in particular were like yo this kind of sound would be great for you um you know so you know when they go to make around the world in a day and a day uh wendy and lisa's each of them has a brother who worked together who made a song called Around the World in the Day that Prince heard and loved and that, that becomes the sonic inspiration for the rest of the album. Um, you know, so others are influencing him. So the sort of, the, the folks who come along after the revolution are influencing him in a different direction. And you know, yeah, they were like, he left the revolution and he started to work with people who, you know, played faster, who were more athletic in the way that they could play. Um, and many of them were, you know, top flight musicians. Um, but the revolution folks say that, that they did not have the same level of relationship with him, like just friendship kinship with him uh in the later groups and and you know it, it you can you can ask the revolution to look forward it's hard for the mpg to look back because they did not experience but like the revolution talked about we were a family and the mpg folks never said that to me and so they seem to have a different relationship with him he was more in charge of the NPG, whereas the revolution was more of a group. He was he was always in charge, but they were there was more of a family aspect to the revolution. And I think that you hear that influence in the music. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that the revolution era is his most creative period, his mo in terms of the quality of the music critically acclaimed um the most commercially acclaimed um well one thing that was really interesting that bobby z uh pointed out was that you know prince was making all the albums before purple rain very quickly um he'd, he'd go off in la or in minneapolis by himself and just like you know he's a song a day right just like zooming through these albums 
With Purple Rain, they're making a movie. So the process had to be slowed down, which gave him much more time to think about what we might add or take away, what we might, you know, in, in terms of like the elements within the records or what songs could be added to this group of songs. There was a much longer period in which he's gestating songs and throwing out most of them by keeping, you know, this epic bunch of songs. And so the reason why Purple Rain is so much bigger and grander is because he was forced by the movie to take so much more time with it. And that's why it's different than the other albums. Um, but the other thing is that I always thought, and this goes back to being a civilian, just being a, a, you know, a younger person, like looking at before I was in media, I always thought that Around the World in a Day was a response to Prince becoming a gigantic global megastar. No, Around the World in a Day was done in the can and like, finished before Purple Rain came out. It's a response in that, like, that was the sonic statement I made there. Now I want to make a different sonic statement. But he did not yet know that he was a global star. There was no promise that the movie and the album were going to work out. Like, you know, maybe he would be seen as arrogant. Maybe they would see the movie as, like, you know, campy. And, uh, you know, like nobody knew. It was not, you know, you never can be like, oh my God, we all knew that it was going to become a global celebrity. And people in every country would be like, this, this, may, like, you had no idea. And, you know, so he, he wanted to do something different, but it, it's not a response to um, his global fame. Yeah. I, I mean, you can, you can start to even hear some of the influences that are going to go into that, like, and take me with you, where you start hearing the, the violins that, psychedelic sound i know a lot of people ascribe to around the world in the day where you go well wait that's on purple rain you go back look at the recording dates and go oh yeah like you said like spring summer 84 he's recording what's going to be on around the world in the day like that's so yeah that you can you can hear bits and pieces come about but yeah that that's a really good point that has nothing one does not have to do with the other necessarily on that it's a really yeah. solid point last question for you um towards the end and the drugs and the opioids and needing that as you talked about to you know, still be part of his his family of fans and going out and touring and performing is this one of these either ors that either you can you can choose to continue to perform if you don't have your if you don't have a family with you you don't have a wife you don't have kids whatever and you and you must go perform, but your body's going to break down as you get older for whatever reason. Whether it was that you know, there was the tub incident, for example, that sort of thing. But you're going to have to take the drugs to do that. You don't have to, but that's a choice. Or you cannot take those, but you're not going to be able to be as active. Is this really an either or situation that we couldn't? We as fans and admirers of the music, we can't have it all. We can't have Prince constantly doing everything. It's one or the other as, as, as a human being, he had to do one thing or the other and he ended up, well, the, the drugs ended up costing his life even as he continued to perform. I mean, you know, Prince didn't have a choice. He had to perform. He had to be out there with the family, the fans, the people he loved. He had to keep that part of him going. He had to be that guy. And, um, you know, there was just, there, there was no other option for him. And, um, you know, it, you know, a lot was in turmoil in this period because he's debating whether or not to have hip surgery because he needs that to get out of the chronic pain. Um, but he, he's, and I never got a clear answer of whether or not he did it. Some said he did, some said he didn't. Um, so I was never really sure which way he went, but he had become a Jehovah's Witness in the wake of losing his uh, baby. So he is struggling with the faith says that you're not supposed to, you know, like cut open the body. So like, I'm not supposed to do that. And he was very serious about his, uh, his being witness. You know, he knocked on doors and, you know, he took it very seriously. So um you know, he's like, I don't know. However, 
the faith surely does not say it's okay to take pills, right? But like, so he, he's clearly like going a, around what the faith wants here, but not, did you know, not here, but he, it, you know, it, it was a clear, it was clearly a time of turmoil for him. And where am I going and how am I getting there? And what am I supposed to do? And how do I keep this life that is everything to me going? And, you know, this is a person who was in massive self-control throughout his life. You know, this is a person, person who, you know, as a very, very young person, like four or five years old or something, um, was having seizures. And one day said to his mother, I'm going to stop having seizures. And he just did. And like, who does that? Like, you don't just will your way out of seizures, you know, but like, you know, gargantuan self-control. I mean, like to not do cocaine and not be tempted to do drugs in the 80s when every even rock and roll is filled with it. And the music business is filled with it. Um, you know, and he was like, you don't need that drink. Stop drinking. Like, you know, like, you know, gargantuan self-control throughout his life. I imagine that he thought, sure, like I can control this too. And um, next thing you know, you can't. It is a fascinating book. I would encourage anyone to to deep dive into it more, read the whole thing. You're going to learn a lot. Nothing compares to you, an oral history of Prince by Touré. Thank you for taking time to chat about this today. It was, it was a great, great book to read. Thank you for doing this. And thank you for all the Prince insight you've been able to give us. Uh, looking forward to more of your material down the road. But thank you for doing this book. Luke, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks.